If you will, in your Bibles, follow along or on the screen, Matthew 18, which is our text for this evening's message. Matthew 18, 1 through 14. Again, the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and again, a teaching about the kingdom of heaven. Great and oft addressed subject on our Savior's heart. Matthew 18, verse 1 and following. At that time, the disciples came to Jesus, saying, Who then is greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And he called a child to himself and set him before them and said, Truly I say to you, unless you are converted and become like children, you shall not enter the kingdom of heaven. Whoever then humbles himself as this child, he is greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And whoever receives one such child in my name receives me. But whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to stumble, it is better for him that a heavy millstone be hung around his neck, that he be drowned in the depth of the sea. Woe to the world because of its stumbling blocks, for it is inevitable that stumbling blocks come. But woe to that man through whom the stumbling block comes. And if your hand or your foot causes you to stumble, cut it off and throw it from you. It is better for you to enter life crippled or lame than having two hands or two feet to be cast into the eternal fire. If your eye causes you to stumble, pluck it out, throw it from you. It is better for you to enter life with one eye than having two eyes to be cast into the fiery hell. See that you do not despise one of these little ones, for I say to you that their angels in heaven continually behold the face of my Father who is in heaven. For the Son of Man has come to save that which was lost. What do you think? If a man has a hundred sheep and one of them has gone astray, does he not leave the ninety-nine on the mountains and go and search for the one that is straying? And if it turns out that he finds it, truly I say to you, he rejoices over it more than over the ninety-nine which have not gone astray. Thus it is not the will of your Father in heaven that one of these little ones perish. May God grant to us a profound appreciation of the words of our Savior. Let's pray. Lord, we know that Every ability that we have is a gift of your grace. That every inclination of the heart that is consistent with your word is a gift of sovereign love. And so we ask you to grant the work of your Holy Spirit, Father, such that our hearts will embrace and apply and delight in those portions of your word we consider and the principles they reflect. Grant us, we pray, that grace for your glory and honor and the honor of Jesus Christ, whose teachings we will be especially considering. And all of this, Father, in Jesus' name we plead. Amen. I suspect many of you know that the apostles had several problems. And one of the problems they had was quibbling about who was going to be greatest in the kingdom of God. Indeed, at the time of the Last Supper, they argued about who would be greatest. And if ever there was an example of the powerful, insidious nature of pride, that certainly, it seems to me, is an example. Consider the account in Mark 9, beginning with verse 33. And he came to Capernaum, and when he was in the house, he began to question them, 
What were you discussing on the way? Of course, we know that Jesus knew, but he puts it to them with a question. But they kept silent. For on the way they had discussed which one, which one another, with one another, which of them was the greatest. Ponder this. They're in the presence of Jesus. And this subject comes up again and again. And sitting down, he called the twelve and said to them, If anyone wants to be first, he shall be last of all and servant of all. And taking a child, he set him before them. And taking him in his arms, he said to them, Whoever receives one child like this in my name receives me. And whoever receives me does not receive me, but him who sent me. And then, if you will, one more, Luke 22. Verse 24. And there arose a dispute among them as to which of them was regarded to be the greatest. If you remember on another occasion, two of them asked Jesus, two of the apostles asked Jesus if they could sit on the right and left hand of his throne. What an incredible insight into our basic nature, men here in the very presence of Jesus Christ. So Jesus Christ took the occasion as recorded in our text to turn the tables in their perspective. He still stayed with the issue of the kingdom, but from an entirely different point of view, a different focus. And in our text, he lays down two non-negotiable conditions for kingdom admission. Now, these are not the only ones, and I don't believe any of us can appreciate all in one great singular moment the different conditions of kingdom subject citizenship, if I could invent a term here. But here are two. You find it at the beginning of our text. The first is verse 3, unless you are converted. And the second is unless you become like children. Now I'm not going to address the issue of conversion, which is of course a great central doctrine of the gospel rightly understood. Just to remind you that Jesus Christ at the opening of his public ministry talking to Nicodemus pointed out that unless we're born again, we shall not see the kingdom of heaven, John 3. Unless we're born again, we cannot enter the kingdom. And the fact that we have to come to the place where we exercise saving faith in Christ as our only redeemer, and see the need to repent, with God-given repentance for our sin, we have no legitimate hope of kingdom participation. But here are two different conditions that one involves a point in time, and we do recognize that there's some point at which we are converted and become children of the Most High God, where we have our names written in the book of life, where we are accepted in Christ the Beloved. But then there's a process, and become like children. Become like children. I have an opinion I've held for some time, and sadly I think it's growing, that I believe the besetting sin that we have in the OPC amongst teaching elders particularly, and the potential, I believe, for its increase is great, is the sin of intellectual arrogance. I believe that we are seeing a great emphasis on presumably precise theology without a commensurate emphasis on the growth and holiness. I believe it. And I think that 
Jesus Christ is giving us a marvelously helpful insight into the growing and holiness. Remember the words of the author of Hebrews, Hebrews 12. Pursue peace with all men and the holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. We're to pursue sanctification. And one of the elements of pursuing sanctification is to become like children. Well, we know children have a sin nature. And so clearly there are some aspects of being or becoming like a child that clearly Christ did not intend. Now, I think we can say without being presumptive that he clearly did not intend us to include in our assessment of this command the idea that we should be fickle and double-minded and easily offended. Consider the words of our Savior in chapter 11 of Matthew, verses 12 and 13. And from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffers violence, and violence men take it by force. For all the prophets in the law prophesied until John. And if you care to accept it, he himself is Elijah who was to come. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. But to what shall I compare this generation? It is like children sitting in the marketplaces who call out to other children and say, we played the flute for you and you didn't dance. We sung a dirge and you did not mourn. For John came neither eating nor drinking and they say he has a demon. And the son of man came eating and drinking and behold, they say, a gluttonous man and a drunkard, a friend of tax gatherers and sinners. Yet wisdom is vindicated by her deeds. So I think we can say dogmatically that Christ did not intend us to be fickle or easily offended, uh, to have a willingness to complain uh, quickly and whiningly. I think that he clearly does not intend us to imitate childish disrespect and the capacity to mock. And if you remember in 2 Kings chapter 2, we have the brief but poignant account of the young man that came out to mock Elisha after Elijah had been accepted or caught up into heaven in a whirlwind. He's returning from that, and the children came out of the city and began to mock his bald head. And bears came up and ate, I think if my memory's right, the number was 40 of them, or killed them. So clearly, Christ is not in any way giving us the idea of cruel, mocking, disrespectful behavior as acceptable. And then, if you remember the words of Samuel to Saul in 2 Samuel chapter 15, verse 23, rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. We know children are rebellious. And so clearly we can say Christ did not intend us to imitate that rebellious spirit. That's clearly not what's intended by our Savior. And in Proverbs 22, verse 15, we're told that foolishness is bound in the heart of a child. So God is not calling us to be foolish, not to be confused with what Paul was saying in a ironic sense when he's talked about the foolishness of preaching the gospel. It's not the same issue at all, but the things that children can do that are truly foolish. Well then, that raises a question, what did he mean? When he says, and you will not enter the kingdom unless you become like children. And I, as I was preparing this sermon, I got to thinking, in all the years I've had the privilege of hearing sermons, I've never heard this subject addressed, other than in passing at best. I'm not saying that it hasn't been, but I think in our Reformed churches we tend to not strongly address the issue of little children. And yet, if you remember in the passage for meditation, 
that we began our service with, Christ said even of babies, Luke 18, that is included in the model that we're to follow. So this, I believe, for the student of scripture who loves the word is an intriguing question. And God gives us some insight that is directly from scripture, but some of it's from experience. But before we address those characteristics that I believe fall within the purview of our Savior's concern to help us, I want to point out something else. And that is that God, which um, hopefully has already become somewhat apparent, God has a high place in the economy and government of his kingdom for little children. Little children mean a great deal to our God in heaven, to our Savior. And as our passage in Matthew 18 points out, in what is something we cannot fully understand what it means, there is an issue even of angelic beings involved in this matter of God's high regard for little ones. Matthew 18.10, See that you do not despise one of these little ones. Whatever is involved in looking at them demeaningly or a little or in some dismissive sense is forbidden. Because I say to you that their angels in heaven continually behold the face of my Father who is in heaven. Now as with every other precious doctrine of scripture, the doctrine of angelic servants has been corrupted by many. But I do not believe God blesses dealing with a problem by reactive dismissal. And the fact is, he has said from our Savior's mouth that there are angels that have some kind of assignment on behalf of little children before the face of our Father in heaven, which I believe is a very poignant clue as to the high regard that our God has for little ones. Matthew 10, if you will, please. Verse 42. And whoever in the name of a disciple gives to one of these little ones even a cup of cold water to drink, truly I say to you, he shall not lose his reward. If the only ministry that we can extend to children is a cup of cold water, in God's great and perfect wisdom, that constitutes a memorable shepherding and ministry. Matthew 19 Verse 13 and following. Then some of the children were brought to him so that he might lay his hands on them and pray, and the disciples rebuked them. And Jesus said, Let the children alone and do not hinder them from coming to me, for the kingdom of heaven belongs to such as these. And the whole subject of how the kingdom of heaven belongs to little ones is a tremendous issue in its own right. I don't have time here to uh, undertake an exposition of that, but suffice it to say, I think it's a high-profile principle that Christ reiterated enough times that it should be something that we take very seriously. Mark 9, verse 42. Whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to stumble, it would be better for him if with a heavy millstone hung around his neck he had been cast into the sea. And finally, Luke 17, and yet another occasion, similar words spoken by our Savior, verses 1 and 2. And he said to his disciples, it is inevitable that stumbling blocks should come but woe to him through whom they come. It would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were thrown into the sea than that he should cause one of these little ones to stumble. So while causing an offense, causing someone to stumble is serious, there's a particular focus 
and the words of our Savior on causing children to stumble. And so, once again, from yet another perspective, we see that God the Father places a very high value on little children and even babies. So what is there about children that constitutes this model, if I may use that word, that we are to understand and presumably imitate? Well, if you'll turn back for a moment to Matthew 18, I believe there's one very helpful word. In chapter 18, verse 4. Whoever then humbles himself as this child, he is greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And all of the points that I'm going to lay before you, which I believe are supportable from Scripture, are attitudes and actions that can be construed properly as humble. That there is something about little children before they learn to imitate the world, that there are attitudes and outlooks that little ones demonstrably have that can be described as humble. And if we remember that our Lord Jesus Christ again and again warned us to avoid the temptation of self-exaltation, specifically in Matthew 23, Luke 14, Luke 18, that he who exalts himself will be abased, but he who humbles himself will be exalted. This is a tremendous key to unlocking, I believe, a right understanding of how it, what it means to humble ourselves as little children in order to be inheritors of the kingdom. Now, as with everything else, of course, one can debate worst-case scenarios, and some children grow up in such horrible homes that they're contaminated almost from the day of birth, and sometimes if their mothers are druggies from the time of conception or alcoholics. So I'm presuming in the examples that I give you that Jesus Christ was speaking of households or homes in which the children are loved, a home with loving parents. And I think all of these distinctives can be found, for the most part, in godly homes where the parents cherish and love their children. So that's the qualifier on what I propose to you now are those marks of behavior and attitude on the part of children that constitutes, if you will, a pair of binoculars to look into the kingdom of heaven. These are not in a particularly sacred order. I'm not saying ones or any one is more important than the others. Is it true or not that children early sense their dependence on their parents? Do they not? Before a baby can talk, it can squawk. And children know how to cry for mom, do they not, when they're very small. Children are not hesitant to acknowledge their utter dependence on their parents, and they're not ashamed of that dependence. To be ashamed of their dependence is an irrelevancy. Yet as we are adults, one of the things that we find in our culture which teaches the myth of independence and the glorification of deadly pride is the idea that we can be independent and not dependent. And we know, in fact, from the teaching of Scripture, we're utterly dependent on God for everything, physically as well as spiritually. The words of our Savior in the night of his betrayal so well underline that when he said, without me you can do nothing. We know we can't even take a breath without him. And children are not the least bit hesitant to assume that their parents will take care of them. Children accept parents' discipline, do they not? Doesn't mean they accept it well, but when it's administered in love, they embrace it. 
in time. Uh, you may wait for a while, if you're a parent, until your child comes and says, Mother, Dad, thank you for loving me enough to discipline me. But godly children eventually come to that place. And as we were discussing this afternoon in the Hudson household, children need boundaries. And when they have those boundaries, they have a security that's real for them. And so I ask you, do we accept God's discipline? Do we accept our dependent estate upon him? Children trust their parents to protect them from danger and to nurture them, do they not? Children trust their parents to feed them, to clothe them, to house them, and to protect them from danger or other things that would seem to threaten them. They suffer, they suffer their parents, if I may put it that way, to be protective, are not embarrassed by it. And the question I would raise is, do we trust our Heavenly Father? I don't believe it's an accident that the longest section of the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 6, concerns the issue of trusting God and not doubting his fatherly care. That's verses 25 through 34. So God calls us to be a people who not are only not ashamed to trust him, but indeed delight in it. Children in a loving home don't like separation from their parents. And godly parents who treat their children with kindness know that leaving a child with another person on the first day times those are tried can be a traumatic experience for the child. The child wants that sense of protection. And do you and I fear, in a good sense of the word, being separate from God, if only by reason of busyness and the cares of this world, as Christ talked about in the parable of the sower? Do we have an unblushing willingness to neglect prayer, to neglect fellowship with our Heavenly Father and with our Savior. Little children are unashamed to receive expressions of parental and sibling affection. Now I will say this, that girls tend to be more willing to accept that than boys. And boys tend to be embarrassed by their sister's affection as boys get older, but when little ones are very small, they're not ashamed of, of affection from either siblings or parents. The Bible tells us to greet one another with a holy kiss. The Bible tells us to focus on the love of Christ, the love of God the Father. Do we do that with not only gladness but faith? And then even more profoundly, I believe it is, the children don't even think to try to earn their parents' love. They just accept it. Do they not? Children don't come to their parents in a loving home and say, Mom, do you love me? Dad, do you love me? Children just don't normally do that. Yet how often do we who claim the name of Jesus Christ, doubt our Heavenly Father's love when we face trial, difficulty, sorrow, and sometimes even persecution. Do we have a tendency to be fearful? The Bible tells us perfect love casts out fear in 1 John 4. And when children are fearful, they run to their parents jump into their mother's or father's arms and find comfort. And so you and I, we can use the language of being in the arms of Jesus Christ, of trusting our Heavenly Father's arms around us, and yet still be consumed with fear. And I think in a loving home, early in life, children may fear falling off a chair or something, but in the main, are not consumed with fear about their security. 
Little children are unashamed to express love to their parents as well as to receive it. And I think it's no small, it's no small significance that the first and great commandment is a commandment to love our Heavenly Father and His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Children of loving parents are unashamed to call for help in time of need. I could not count the number of times over the years the Lord has permitted me to serve as a pastor in which I have found people coming up with some reason in a time of trial to not call for help. I've heard far more men say this than women, but, oh, I don't want to bother God with my problems. He's too busy. He's too big. And what a demeaning, ungodly picture of the tender care of our Heavenly Father who notices when each sparrow falls and clothes each lily of the field. Children cry out for their parents the minute that they sense need and help and protection. Children don't stew and fret about the f idea of being worldly, s successful, obtaining wealth, prestige, and so on. Tell me, dear ones, is this true or not, that as we get older, the temptation to imitate the world and to buy into the world's values is great. Is that not true? And little children could care less about the world. In fact, one of the tasks we have as parents is teaching little ones there is a world out there and we need to have certain understanding of it. But little children aren't wor worried about are they going to have name recognition or have 15 minutes of fame or some such vanity. And I believe that an expression of that is that when children are very little, they tend to be open and direct, and they soon learn what's not appropriate to say. But children, when they're one and two and three, aren't concerned about putting on a facade. No three-year-old wonders, well, now what's my persona? What am I projecting? Oh, please. That's not an issue in their life. Children that are in a loving home do want to please their parents. And we know that the scripture calls us not to be men pleasers, but to God pleasers. Again, a childlike attitude and outlook. Children in a godly home want to learn from their parents. Do we want God to teach us? Do we want the Holy Spirit to enlighten us? Are we eager for the instruction of the Spirit? Children have a remarkable capacity for remembering their parents' promises. Parents, if you've had children, can you remember a child saying, but mother, daddy, you promised, and then fill in the blank. And if the promise is not immediately fulfilled, they can remind you sometimes on a daily basis. Do we remind God of the promises he has made to his redeemed children? Are we ready to remind our Heavenly Father of those promises and to plead for their fulfillment? Children are not afraid to cry out when injured. They're not afraid to acknowledge their need of help in that respect of healing. Children are not ashamed of being children. Now, when children get older, then they eventually figure out there are attractions of the adult world and they want to grow up and they say that sort of thing. When they're one and two and three, the idea of not being a child is just a non-issue. It isn't even a, in their frontal lobes. It's not on their horizon. Children are willing to accept 
And I don't think the word accept is even good because it's not an acceptance issue. They just embrace the fact that they're children. And they don't ponder the philosophical implications of being a child. They accept that status. They embrace it. And as I've suggested already, children don't try to maintain a facade. They say what they think. You know where a little child is at. I remember many years ago on my first deployment, the Vietnam War was still going on. I was riding a destroyer that was going to be doing destroyer duty in the Tonkin Gulf. And that was after the attacks by North Torpedo Boats on the Turner Joy and another destroyer had early taken place. So naturally I was thinking about this whole matter of going into a combat zone. And in Guam, we stopped for resupply and repairs. And that's where we got our first mail. And it had been, I'd been away from home now nearly a month. Opened that first letter with trembling hands from my dear wife. And in it, she made the following statement. Bethel said the other day, Bethel our, being our eldest, God knows everything in the whole world, and my daddy knows almost as much. <laughs> well, I knew it would be downhill from there. <laughs> but I believe that was a remarkable illustration of the way little children have great expectations of their parents. Little children love to imitate their parents. If you ever want to know how children see their parents, listen to them while they're playing house. Listen to them while they're playing house. And you will get a wealth of information, maybe not all of it flattering, but you will see how they see you. And children that come even from bad homes often struggle for much of a lifetime and purging from their own life, unconsciously adopted attitudes and behaviors of parents. Do we imitate our Heavenly Father? Be ye holy even as I am holy. Do we follow Jesus Christ in his footsteps as we're told in 1 Peter 2? Are we followers of Christ, imitators of Christ? And then I think one that's just beautiful is that children tend to have great expectations of their parents. I remember on one occasion, we were asked by one of our daughters to purchase some rather monumental item. And we said, well, we don't have the money to do it. And this particular offspring said, well, Daddy, just go write a check. You can do it. <laughs> there was a bit of a deficiency in fiscal understanding. But the spirit was, all I had to do was sign a check and I could produce anything. And I believe that the abundance of God is something that we often take lightly. That God is a God of abundance. And he calls us to believe that and to behave as those who know their God, their Heavenly Father, their Redeemer is a God of abundance. Jesus said of those that come to him, out of such will flow, flow rivers of living waters. Remarkable. Remarkable. The increase of grace and blessing for those that trust their Heavenly Father and their Savior as a little child. Now, how do you and I apply this? Well, I think you've already gotten some sense that in the light of each of these characteristics, we can ask ourselves, do we behave in a similar way toward our Father who is in heaven, toward our Redeemer, who is our Lord, our Shepherd, our King, our Teacher, our Great High Priest? Do we want to imitate children with respect to our relationship to God. And that now brings me to this word, relationship. 
I think it's been recognized, certainly it was by the Puritans, that it's possible to have an intellectual grasp of doctrine without it affecting our life. It is possible to become very sophisticated in thinking. And I think indeed that one of the reason, one of the compelling reasons for the decline of the universities in the United States became Ivy League colleges that started out with only the exception of Brown University as seminaries was the virus, the prideful intellectual virus of Scottish rationalism. So here's the two words to put together, humble and relationship. God wants a relationship with us. He wants us to be doctrinally faithful. He wants us to speak the truth in love. He wants us to be jealous for the integrity of Scripture and the doctrines of Scripture. But never, never, never confuse that high and holy duty with a vibrant, vital relationship with him through his son. Without that, we become Pharisees. Without that, we become nominalists. Without a relationship grounded on love and trust, our profession of faith in Jesus Christ can on the day of judgment increase our condemnation. Romans chapter 8, verse 16. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. This is speaking to adults, but notice the language. Children of God. And if children, if indeed we are children, heirs also heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him, in order that we may be also glorified with him. We are called to be seen, among other things, as children of the Most High God. Romans 9, 6 through 8. But it is not as though the word of God has failed, for they are not all Israel who are descended from Israel, neither are they all children, because they are Abraham's descendants. But through Isaac your descendants will be named. That is, it is not the children of the flesh who are children of God, but the children of the promise are regarded as descendants. Isn't that beautiful? The children of promise. The parallel between the way we are to look at our Heavenly Father and the way children look at their loving parents is profound. I proposed to you earlier in our consideration that the word humble is critical in terms of assisting us in embracing and growing in this grace of becoming like children. Here's what could appear to be an irony, that the more childlike I become, the closer I walk with Christ, if I've understood what that means. To put it another way, the more mature in the faith I become, the more I should become like a child in terms of my, here's that word, dear ones, relationship with God and his Son and his Spirit. When it comes to matters of salvation, are we not children? Are we not, dear ones? Are we not as dependent as a nursing babe is on its mother for the grace of Almighty God in our lives? Can you and I think a correct thought apart from his grace? Can we make a right decision 
Can we face an uncertain future without childlike faith in some measure? And I think not. So is my relationship with God a humble one? I believe it's a great help for embracing that elusive quality of humility by being willing to think of ourselves as dependent and responsive as a little child is to a loving parent. I believe that's a good help in slaying the demon of pride that can rise within our breast like a serpent out of its out of its lair. And dear ones, if you think about it, children don't determine the nature of the relationship with their parents. Their parents do. Do they not? For good or for ill. The parents set the tone of the home. The parents establish the framework that will govern their relationship with their children and their children with them. And is that not true of the family of God? That as children, we are in the kingdom on his terms as our not only heavenly father, but our glorious king. Turn once more, please, to Luke 18. Luke 18, beginning with verse 15. And they were bringing even their babies to him so that he might touch them. But when the disciples saw it, they began rebuking them. Let me ask you a question. Do you believe, in light of what we've reconsidered this evening, that rebuking parents for bringing their children was an illustration of not becoming like children, but rejecting the idea of becoming like children. For Christ used that in contradistinction to his alternative view of becoming like children. Jesus called for them saying, Permit the children to come to me. Permit them to come to me. Don't hinder them with adult vanities, we could say. Do not hinder them, for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. Brothers and sisters in Christ, I ask you, are the words of Jesus Christ absolutely true? The kingdom of God belongs to children, even babies. And if that is so, dare I reject the model that God has given me in little children in the way they perceive their parents. The kingdom of God belongs to such as these. Truly I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child shall not enter in at all. I would hope that what we have considered this evening would be an encouragement to the refreshment of pursuing childlike faith. I don't believe any of us are beyond having our faith contaminated with sophistication, worldliness, worry, fearfulness, and the cares of this world. And this is a call, I believe with all my heart, to search our own hearts, as we're to do before we partake of the Lord's Supper, as to whether we discern the body of Christ. And clearly, Christ has indicated that his body includes children, even little babies. Lord, we need to say in our prayers, Help me to have, to exercise 
to grow in the grace of humbly becoming like a little child, using those means of grace he's given to grow in that grace. Amen.